Welcome. I'm Rona Mackay, MSP, co-convener of the Cross Party Group on Men's Violence Against Women and Girls, and also a member of the Criminal Justice Committee. I'd like to welcome you all to this special online edition of the Festival of Politics 2021 in partnership with the Parliament's think tank, Scotland's Futures Forum. This afternoon's panel is titled Violence Against Women, and it's held in partnership with Scottish Women's Aid. We are delighted that so many people are able to join us online today, and I look forward to hearing comments and questions from you as we get into our discussion. We're delighted to offer BSL interpretation for today's event and look forward to receiving questions and comments. I should also add that there's a helpline on the festival webpage for this event, should anyone wish to use it. Violence against women is one of the most pervasive human rights violations, according to the United Nations. Rooted in gender and harmful culture and social norms, it is also recognised as a public health issue adversely affecting women's health. Despite movements like Me Too and Everyday Sexism, it is still normal for women to adapt and restrict their behaviours by swapping safety for freedom to avoid violence and harassment in public. So, How do we challenge and who is challenging the men perpetrating the violence? And Why does the responsibility for dealing with this public health issue still seem to lie with women? This panel aims to address all of these questions in the next 60 minutes or so, so, so do stay with us. We're delighted that you're all able to join us and to take part, and I would encourage you to use the event chat, chat function to introduce yourselves, stating your name and your geographical location, and pose any questions you would like the panel to respond to. I'm very pleased to be joined by our panellists. They are Dr Marcia Scott, Chief Executive of Scottish Women's Aid, Davy Thompson, Campaign Director with White Ribbon Scotland, and Professor Karen Boyle, Professor of Feminist Media Studies and Programme Director of Applied Gender Studies at the University of Strathclyde. She is the author of Hashtag Me Too and Weinstein and Feminism. So, as I said, there will be an opportunity for our on online audience um, to put questions and views to the panel throughout the event. If you would like to make a contribution, please enter them into the question and answer box. Make sure you state your first name and where you are, and we will get through as many as possible. However, I'd like to begin by asking each of our panellists their reaction to the statement by HM Inspector for Constabulary for England and Wales, Zoe Billingham, who said in September this year, We're all, We are living during a national epidemic of violence against women and girls. She went on to describe it as deep rooted, pervasive in society, and that we need urgent action to address this. So I'd like to ask the panellists if they agree with our statement. And I'm going to come first to um, Dr. Marcia Scott, then Professor Karen Boyle, and then to Davy Thompson. Marcia. Um, I, I think there I have two sort of conflicting responses to that statement. Um, clearly, I I think you know I agree about the deep-rooted um, nature of violence against women and girls and um, uh, and the urgency from our perspective of um, doing something substantial about it. I guess the, the part that I would take issue with is um, that the implication that this is a, a, a sudden epidemic. And actually, I, I rather, I suppose, maybe too flippantly call um, uh, domestic abuse and violence against women the, the pandemic without a PR company. Um, you know, we, we, we have been seeing these kinds of uh, numbers about the um, prevalence of violence against women across the world for centuries. This is not a new problem. So the, the question really is, what are we going to do differently? You know, it's that whole thing, if you do what you've always done, you get what you've always got. And I think for me, the biggest and most important questions are, wh what are the things that will change our structures and our systems? Um, in material and, and dramatic ways. Thank you, uh, Marcia. Can I can I come now to um, Professor Karen Boyle, please? Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Yes, Karen. Okay, yes, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, Marcia said exactly what I was going to say. The panel's going <laughs> second. Um, I completely agree with Marcia that um, the statement's really helpful in pointing to the severity of the issue and the need for urgent action, but I'm also slightly frustrated with that sense that it's new, 
that it's sudden. It's not. Um, but also I'm slightly cautious of any kind of attempt to get us to take men's violence against women seriously by likening it to something else we might take seriously, like a pandemic that you know we're we're experiencing now, or like torture. And I'm not saying there are not elements in common, there are, but I think we need to take men's violence against women seriously as men's violence against women and not um I understand the temptation to reach for these other ways of talking about it to make it urgent. I, I like Marsha's idea of the, the PR company behind it almost. Um, but it gives me pause. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Karen. Davy, would you like to comment? Yeah, well, you'd not be too surprised to know that I would echo the comments um, about this not being something new. Um, clearly, this has been going on for as long as anybody can remember and beyond. Um, I, I think what I'd pick up on is the, the comment about the need for urgent accent, urgent action. I think what we need to urgently do is start changing the actions that we're taking and uh, putting more commitment into it. It's commitment and persistence that's going to change things. It's moving things into uh, changes within communities. It's engaging enough of the population in the need to bring about change. And it's getting that commitment to last rather than it just being a reaction to something terrible that's happened at one stage. We've seen that over and over again. We you know, we, we refer to Sarah Everard and the incident there um, and the horrendous crime that that was. But there's been about 80 women murdered since then. So th this is not individual incidents. This is something that needs persistence of approach to address it. Uh, thank you, Davy. Um, I mean, that actually leads me on to uh, the next question, which I would like to ask the, the panellists um, before opening up the, uh, to, to the online questions. Um, and if we could go back to Marsha, please. Um, you know, Davy mentioned Sarah Everard, and 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 the you know there's other atrocities like um, sisters Nicole Smallman and Biba Henry murders. And do you think the the debate about misogyny becoming a hate crime? Does this mean that we're actually now talking about this unspoken unspo epidemic in a serious way that will lead to fundamental change that, as you say, has never been achieved before? Do you think we are now at a watershed? Uh, I think the only answer to that will come in 10 years. Um, I do think uh, the debate about misogyny as a hate crime signals um, two things, really. It signals that that we can say the word misogyny in public now without being, you know, pointed at and, and pelted as feminazis, um, which is a nice change in my life. Um, but uh, I think uh, it it's symbolic in that sense. The existing discussions in Scotland around misogyny and hate crime um, are in a much narrower framework than what we really need, um, and than what we need to do for challenging violence against women, um, it's, it's much more focused on um, uh, harassment in public, and which is a big gap, I think. But I, I think the, the thing that I would want to say, and it sort of piggybacks on, on what Davey was saying, which is that um, what we, you know, we, we have a reputation now in the world, I know because I get asked to talk about it all the time, for having the world's gold standard domestic abuse law, and when people asked me what made that law special, I said it was about the fact that for 20 years now, we've known that violence against women and domestic abuse were causes and consequences of women's inequality. Um, unfortunately, it is only recently that we have started to do something with that analysis and started to realize that if we want, that a good indicator of our work on violence against women is have we closed the pay gap? Are you know women still disproportionately so much more likely to be poor? Are children so much more likely to be poor? Um, you know all of the uh, are women 50% of our parliament? Not yet. Are they 50% of our local authorities? Not yet. Do they are they represented in any meaningful way in our top 500 you know corporations? Not yet. So 
So, you know, we can pretend to work around the edges and, you know, have more helplines and more necessary things like that, none of which will change the prevalence of violence against women. So we, ha we have to either, we have to start walking the walk. Thanks, thanks, Marcia. Hey, Karen, would you like to comment? Sure, yeah, I mean, I, I agree that it'll only be in retrospect we know if this was a turning point. I would like to say I hope so, but I th that might be the triumph of optimism over experience, I suspect. Um, however, to be optimistic for a minute, I think that over the last four years or so, not exclusively since Me Too, but certainly that was important, there have been some important cultural shifts in the way that we talk about men's violence against women and in a willingness to recognise its severity. But two caveats. One, that's certainly not uniform, and we're kidding ourselves, sadly, if we think it is. And secondly, I'm reminded of something Louise Armstrong wrote about. Louise Armstrong was um, one of the first feminists in the US to speak publicly about her experiences of incest in the 1970s. And she talks about the importance, it, like the importance of speaking out, but of doing so in order to build a movement for change. And she makes the point that when the media or when public debate got hold of her story and the stories of other incest survivors, noise started to work in the same way as silence. So it was almost like talking about it all the time became a way of not doing anything about it. Talking replaced the idea of action. Talking meant what we need is therapy, what we need is to support the people who are talking, not we need to change the conditions that enable this to happen and we need to challenge the perpetrators. So that's my glasses half full and half empty answer. Thanks, thanks, Karen. That's that's really interesting. Davy, would you like to comment? I, I think in, in terms of you know the debate about misogyny, misogyny becoming a hate crime, um, laws play a part. The, the main part for me that laws play is that they draw a line in the sand and they say this is not acceptable here. Um, but it doesn't change things in the way that we can change things by looking at the causes of why we've still got misogyny. You know, and, and looking into you know as Marcia says about inequality about uh, about men's feeling of entitlement, about men's attitudes to women, and you know, like so the Me Too and everything has brought a lot of that out. The, because one of the first things we're always telling men in White, White Ribbon Scotland, uh, who are working with us, is, is that we need to be listening to the women in our lives. Um, so it's important to listen to those messages, but we we need to be reaching out to the guys that aren't necessarily reaching us. They have the discussion about what effect misogyny is having. So it's all that kind of backup of effort to address the issues that are leading to the calls for the change in the, the law. Yeah, Thank, thanks, Davy. Um, I mean, that actually leads me into a question. Um, it's one that's been posted, but I, but I have it here as well that I, I was going to bring up. And it, the question in the chat is from um, Maddie Ridge. And she said, what do you think about the recent reports of spiking in nightclubs, which mostly affects women? So my question was going to be, does it seem as if women are being left to deal with this and the onus is still on them changing behaviours rather than dealing with the root cause, which is male behaviour? Um, so, you know, the spiking drinks and in injections that we've just heard about over the last um, couple of days is horrendous and it's terribly disturbing. But, um, you know, why is it? Why is the onus left on women? And do you think that is the case? Can I come to Marcia again, please? Uh, I, um, it's a very familiar um, dynamic, I have to say, from our perspective. Certainly, the you know the world I work in, which is the world of domestic abuse, um, every single element of women's experience when they uh, disclose uh, domestic abuse and involves some significant danger of being held responsible for the behavior that's not that's not in their gift. Um, whether it's their role as mother or whether it's um, calling the police and and um, uh, being having to worry about uh, 
social work um, threatening to take the children away, you know, whatever the whatever the mechanisms are. I would say that um, uh, what would be, well, first of all, I just want to do a little bit of a shout out to Police Scotland. I think their response was refreshingly different from what some of the police responses were down south. Um, I think they said it's on us, uh, and that that was um, quite uh, refreshing. But the reality is we have to see what Police Scotland does um, uh, about changing the the way um, uh, the organization and the institution operates and how does it reflect women's equality in the work that they do across all of the the domains of Police Scotland. And I, and I think that um, uh, similarly, you know, changing the situation with violence against women and with women's equality, it essentially is going to require a shift in power. And that's the part that the system resists the most strongly. And it's exactly like Karen described, you know, if we talk about it endlessly, that maybe gets us off the hook about doing something about it. But the reality really is, is that if we make women look like they're responsible for this and say, well, you just tell us what to do. Well, we have been telling them what to do. We've been telling them for decades what to do. You know, quotas around voting, um, uh, changing the way we have economic policy that isn't based on a on a 1940s model of the household, uh, you know, changing the labor market laws so that women aren't disadvantaged, childcare for everybody, you know, I mean, there, it's, it's none of this is a surprise. So the reality for me is, um, you can continue saying to women how much you care and how much you want to see this change, and that is sincere on a lot of people's parts. Um, but. But when we start to shift the way power is distributed in our families, in our communities, in our institutions, is when we will begin to take seriously that um, that that there are allies in this work that aren't blaming women for their own victims victimhood. Thank you, Thanks, Marcia. So <laughs> and Davy, would you like to comment? Uh, I mean, I think in terms of the the reports that are coming out of spiking um, or, or drugging. Let's be clear here, this is drugging in order to facilitate sexual assaults. Um, and we quite often, when we're dealing with violence against women, come up with names like spiking that somehow take it away from the, the real truth of what's happening here. Um, I think in terms of how we're going to approach it, we, we, we need to realise that this is a societal issue right across the board. That this is happening in a world in which men are living, we it's not happening and it's nothing to do with us. Uh, so when we're talking about things that can be precautionary, we, we've got to stop talking about that being all down to the women. The men that are sitting in their company could be taking precautions about all this too. The men can be reacting to what they are hearing before they even get to venues where this has been occurring. If they hear their friends talking about it, if they hear somebody in the toilets talking about it, as if they don't you know, well, they're so and so. I'm targeting here in one way or another. Whatever way it's phrased, they mm -hmm. can react to that. We, we yeah. need them to realise that this isn't going to stop if we just keep turning around and saying to women, "Have you covered your drinks?" Yeah, yeah. It's just not. It's not sufficient. Yeah, Davy, I'm going to stay with you. There's a question in the chat from Viv, and she says, uh, "Do you think that there can be unintended consequences of the current focus on toxic masculinity?" For example, hardening, hardening of extremist attitudes and more men joining anti-feminist groups such as men's rights movements and men going their own way. I don't know if you'd be able to comment on, on that. Uh, I mean, uh, we get a hardening of attitudes no matter which way we word it. Um, yeah. There's always the, yeah, but it's not all men and these kind of comments. Uh, and, you know, at the end of the day, I don't know anybody that's working in addressing violence against women who thinks this is all men that are per perpetrating this. Yeah. But that's the knee-jerk reaction that comes back quite yeah. often. Uh, yeah. The reality is there are just, you know, over 2,000 reported rapes every year in Scotland. There's over 60,000 incidents of domestic abuse every year in Scotland. And would, yeah, it's not all men. It's clearly an awful lot of men. So yeah. the idea that we can get away with having those kind of reactions, it, mm. it just doesn't sort of work, sure. you know. Um, but I, yeah, the, the 
Sorry, can you remind me of the start of the question? I just lost my train of thought. There. It just no, it was just a, are there are unintended consequences of sort of toxic yeah. masculinity, men joining extremist yeah. groups, etc. I mean, yeah, phrases like toxic masculinity get jumped on by these groups. But the reality is, when we don't talk to men about toxic masculinity as if masculinity is toxic. We mm. talk to them about the elements within masculinity that are toxic, yeah. and that's. True of so many things in life, you know. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, people think that because you've come up with this phrase or way of describing something, that we're applying it to everything in that particular category. Uh, so, yeah, it's used rather than being a reaction. It's used as a way of um, biting back. Mm -hmm. Okay, Davy, thank you. Um, I'm going to take a couple of questions and kind of roll them into one. And if I could come to Karen, please, um, with them. It's a question from Councillor Julie Bell. Um, she said there are women in this event who have been fighting for this their entire working lives. What else do we need apart from persistence and longevity? The second question is from um, Beatrice Wishart, MSP. And this kind of relates to what you were saying in a way, Davy. She said, what are the panellists' views about the way in which the media reports violence against women and girls? Does that help or hinder the public's understanding of the problem and the scale of the problem? So, Karen, if you could kind of Wrap those two together. That would be great. And then I'll come to Marcia. Thank you. Um, what do we need except persistence and longevity? Mm -hmm. I'd like to hear everyone's thoughts on that. <laughs> um, I think uh, one of the things. Actually, no. I do have a po an answer to that, and it's that we need a movement, and and we have a movement, but that's how we survive it, because we need to work collectively. And with shared vision, because doing this stuff on your own is hard, if not impossible. And together, we've got much more chance of affecting change. Mm -hmm. um, we also need people to listen. So speaking out is fine, but you can speak out to your heart's content. If nobody's listening, it's not going to change. And we need to work out the most effective ways keep working out the most effective ways to make that happen. Um, also, I think sometimes we need time off. <laughs> Just on a really, really practical level, I think we've got to look after ourselves if, if you're doing this work all the time. Um, in terms of the media question, um, I, I, we could un I could spend all day answering this. Uh, is the media a problem? And uh, yes. So in short, I would say if we think about things like news coverage, but also fictional representations of men's violence against women, we see a lot of recurring problems. Where I have hope is that more and more that is recognised and called out at the same time, and media organisations sometimes, particularly in Scotland, respond and change headlines or so on. That's the optimistic bit of me. The less optimistic bit of me, in a sense, is a couple of things, really. One, I think there's still a tendency to think that dealing with men's violence against women means retelling survivors' stories. I would never minimise the importance of telling survivors' stories or negate how powerful and empowering that can be for some survivors. However, we have a lot of survivor stories. We know these things already. It should not be incumbent on survivors to keep telling these stories in order for the media to have something to say about men's violence against women. And I would like to see news media in particular make much more use of expertise in this area than they do. So it doesn't always have to be calling Women's Aid or Rape Crisis Scotland to speak to a survivor. Sometimes, actually, getting the bigger picture is really important. And I know that Scottish Women's Aid, Rape Crisis Scotland, and others do really, really important work with the media. But there's there's always more the media can do in that. It's getting away from telling individual stories as though that is going to, in and of itself, solve the problem. Yeah, yeah, good. Survivors 
stories I think I'm saying and those that have already given us our stories we owe them yeah. to listen to it and do something with it and not endlessly require them to tell us again yeah mm -hmm. thank you and um, Marcia would you like to comment yeah there's a couple of things I think um I think it was an interesting question about toxic masculinity and I just want to say that um uh I think Davy's answer was a good um, uh, example of finding ways to talk about toxic masculinity with different audiences that help them hear what we're saying. But the reality is that toxic masculinity, the thing that's unacceptable about it, is that it's toxic. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And mm -hmm. and not talking about it doesn't it challenge it. It just allows it to go in you know invisible yet again. Um, but I do think that it is uh, critical that we think about who the audiences are, and and but also how our attitudes formed and how our attitudes related to behavior, um, and not related to behavior sometimes. So we have some really interesting research from the Scottish Social Attitude Survey that asks people first of all um, some qu some questions about their attitudes about gender roles. You know, so do they hold really um, uh, relatively modern ideas about men and women and, and gender and our roles in family, community, society? Um, or do they hold really um, uh, what we call sort of traditional, you know, old, I would say old fashioned ideas about, you know, women belong in the home and blah, blah, blah. And, and we also asked them in that um, question, in that questionnaire about um, who they think is to blame for rape or who they think is, you know, who's responsible for men's violence against women, essentially. And we can see very clearly from that research that there's a correlation between those who hold really traditional notions of what women and men should do and be um, uh, and a higher tolerance for violence. So, you know, the, we don't have to explain toxic masculinity. What we have to do is have a plan for how are we going to transform people's understandings about gender roles, you know. And, and there was a question I think about schools. You know, that's the key, most important thing that schools can be doing is to integrate from pre preschool on up um, gender, you know, gender competent curricula and programs. And 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 it's not about telling teenage boys not to be violent, <laughs> you know, it's about changing people's attitudes about gender roles. And finally, in terms of uh, Julie's, um, Jules's question about what does it take to stay in this given that, and you can see from the color of my hair, I've been doing it longer than probably anybody. <laughs> um, uh, it not only takes longevity and persistence, it takes sisterhood. And that's, I think, what Karen was saying. And, uh, and the state of the sisterhood in Scotland right now is kind of fraught with a lot of the the online really difficult and and hostile discussions. And yeah. I would say, and I said this at the eulogy for Emma Rich, I said our job now is to take care of the sisterhood in Scotland. Everything that we need to do to make it a place that allows us to continue to do groundbreaking, world-changing work. Yeah, thank, thanks so much. Can I just stay with you, um, Marcia, for a moment? There's an interesting question um, coming from Justina from Edinburgh. Um, and I think it was you that you were talking about um, a shift in power being needed. And Justina is asking if um, do you think the shift in power needed um, to reach full equality is possible in the current capitalist economic system? Uh, probably not. Um, uh, uh, as somebody who, who has seen and critiqued the flaws of capitalism for most of my adult life, um, I think that there are um, uh, lots of debates to be had about economic systems and what will help social justice. Um, and I'm not going to hijack this conversation by talking about other models than capitalism, but I think your point is absolutely well taken, which are there are certainly elements capitalism that are ingrained in our, um, certainly in our economic policies that, that will have to be challenged if we want to, if we want to challenge uh, women's inequality. And if we want to end violence against women, we have to challenge women's inequality. Thanks. Thank you, Marcia. Um, 
I'll go back to Davy now for, for this question from Valentine Scarlett from Dundee. And she says, clearly not all men are misogynist, but surely education has to take a foothold here. Does the system not need to start addressing the question of respect and equality between people at the earliest age, looking at the nature of violence between the genders? Davy. Yeah, I, I mean, that's a really short answer. Yes. Um, <laughs> we need we need to, uh, yeah, be, be driving home, you know, what um, the expectations are on boys in relation to how they look at girls and what they think of girls and how they interact with girls. And we need to build that up throughout the education period of their life. But um, I'm, I'm always very really conscious of the fact that it's really easy if we um, if, if we concentrate entirely on let's change the thinking of children, um, we miss the fact that adults in their lives are still affecting that. And that if we're not reaching out to you know all age groups, then we're not reaching out to the age groups of parents, and they're influencing you know. So I mean, I can think of times when we we have done inputs to young people, and and we know that they've gone home really enthusiastic about what we've been talking about, um, and come in another day and it's been floored because the parent doesn't know enough about the issues that they're now knowing more about, and their reaction isn't that's fantastic do whatever you can or keep involved in that or if there's a project get involved in it uh, the reaction can be to just say what are you doing that for what's that to do with you um, mm -hmm. so I really think it's important that we keep working across all age groups but it's yeah it's vitally important as well that that means addressing um, attitudes uh, right across the board from early ages thanks Davy uh, Karen would you like to come in um I think I've, I've been looking at the questions in the chat and there's some other comments on media that I might bring in here because I think that actually it, it relates partly to what Marsha and Davy were saying as well. So Susan had commented that some of the media outlets condemning violence against women are the same outlets who objectify them in their coverage and don't seem to see there's a link to which I absolutely agree and want to go back to and, and thank Marsha for insisting on the point that it really does, that kind of example really does show that we'll never end men's violence against women until we end gender inequality. And we need to be seeing all the different points of interconnection. So even just to think about a newspaper, we're not going to end men's violence against women just by changing their reporting on crimes committed by men's violence against women. We need to be looking at where are the women editors? We need to be looking at how are women of colour represented in Scottish news, an area I've been working on with Pass the Mic, and Scottish news has a long, long way to go in that respect. We need to be trying to join the dots. And actually, the other thing that I think is quite important, and this relates, again, Marsha made me think of this by talking about the online environment as in particular, is we need to think about what it means challenge ourselves and our own communities and to be angry because there is a space and a time and women have been told for time immemorial that our anger has no place and that our anger is unattractive that our anger is um shrill uh, hysterical not justified and um you know uh, working towards change but we also need to think about the links between anger and aggression, and particularly online, I think. One thing I find really um, depressing, really, is how often I'll see exactly the same people, sometimes people I agree with and sometimes people I don't, on Twitter saying, be nice one day, hashtag, and the next day using language towards another, um, you know, someone they disagree with that's really vile um, derogatory. And I think basically what I'm saying is we need to think about the level and standard of our public debate, and we're all implicated in that. Um, so rather than saying we're all implicated, let me say that differently. Let me say we can all help with that. We've all got a positive role to play in changing the nature of public debate. It's not easy, and we will all make mistakes, and we have to own them when we do. 
Thank you. Thanks, Karen. And um, can I just interject with a, a wee question here? It, it's it's a really wide question, and I, I I don't know. You know, I'm not expecting a you know um, crystal clear answer from anybody really. But um, in England, apparently, the scale of sexual violence ranging from sexual assault, rape, and unwanted sexual comments unsolicited explicit content sent to phones of school-aged girls actually triggered an Ofsted inquiry. And Girl Guiding um, also found that 70% of girls have experienced sexual harassment at school from another student. There's nothing to say that the scale of the issue is, is any no less in Scotland. So the, the question is, how did this come to pass that school-aged girls are on the receiving end of this abuse? And as I say, it's a very, very open-ended question, but um, Marcia, would you like to, to tackle it? I think um, the, 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 you know, we do have evidence that the, the situation is exactly the same in Scotland. And um, uh, I don't think that we got to this place. I think we've been in this place a long time, Rona. Um, when people talk about um, changing the curriculum so that we have, you know, respect and healthy relationships and all that stuff. They really ignore the fact that that might be well and good, but then when they, when the students leave the classroom, they walk into an environment that's toxically sexist, and um, and has been, and has been in every school any of us attended to, I suspect. And um, the problem is that it's so normalized and accepted in in our cultures. Um, that it uh, that we it's invisible. So when we would ask, so some of the work in school in schools has been um, working with young women and young men to ask them what kinds of things are acceptable. And and again, it becomes well, you know, there isn't. We don't see. We see hate crime. We see racism. We see um, homophobia. We see these things. And those and those are readily identifiable to the young people, but the sexism is invisible to them, and they can recount horrific stories. But because it's such an acceptable part of um, of their existence and an unnamed part of their existence, um, it it doesn't even get um, broadcast in any way. And the actions of it, you know, schools I think are really um, complicit because they they fail to. Uh, engage not just in curriculum but in training with teachers and in holding teachers responsible for ignoring um, the sexism that happens every day the sexual assaults the children experience from other students from staff you know i mean it's none of it is new it's just the yeah. one you know there's there's some reason to be optimistic in the sense that we're talking about it now and young people are courageously saying you know, this is what's happening in my school, and yeah. um, and you need to do something about it. Yeah, well, I mean, you're you're, you're so right. And um, talking of young people, we've got a question from Anam, Elise, and Lily from Wood Farm High School, and they're 16 year old girls, and they say they'd like to know your views on boys calling younger girls feminists as an insult. We also feel that the current cur curriculum lacks an education on violence against women. And what role do you think schools should play in this issue? Can I come to Karen for that, please? Yeah, yeah. Thank you for your question. Um, I think you're absolutely right that the curriculum is a really key place where this can be addressed. I think particularly when we're thinking about younger age groups, sometimes it can be quite difficult to address violence. And actually, what we need to be doing all the way through is addressing gender inequality. And that relates, I think, to the first part of your question, which is that feminist becomes an insult. So we need to create a space where that's not the case. Um, I'm also really glad you asked the question the way you did, you know, what can we do about boys calling girls feminists. And it made me reflect on the previous question, which was how did it come to pass that school age girls are on the receiving end of this? And I think we need to flip that round and ask, how did it come to pass that school age boys are perpetuating this, perpetrating this, sorry. Um, and then the other part of that question about school age girls that gives me slight pause 
is I think sometimes if we focus on schools as though what's happening in schools is not also what's happening in workplaces or in groups of adults, there's a danger that we focus on children as uniquely vulnerable and also that we lose the gendered analysis. And I say that because of the work I did looking at the Jimmy Savile case, where one of the things I've noticed um, increasingly is that as time has gone on and as Savile is now routinely referred to as a paedophile, it's as though gender had nothing to do with what he did. Now, he did abuse both boys and girls, but we need to understand what he did as gender-based violence. He, he did it from a particular position of power, and we can't take gender out of the equation of understanding that. But it's almost like the label paedophile becomes a way of then stopping talking about gender. So, if we can see children over here and women over here, you know, they're separate issues. So, it's really important we think of schools, but let's not think that schools are uniquely um, problematic spaces. Um, you know, some of the same approaches we need to take in schools, we need to take in workplaces. Um, you know, um, all kinds of workplaces, not just education settings. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Um, there's a question from Elisa in Glasgow that I'd like to ask Marsha, please, because I think it's um, relevant to, to the work that Marsha does day to day. And she asks, how do we achieve a more nuanced and sensitive policy framework that responds to the needs of marginalised women? Uh, that's a, um, you know, that's, that's a piece of work some of us have been engaged in for most of our lives, too. Um, and it's quite a complex piece of work because if we take intersectionality, which is the buzzword of the day, um, seriously, then we really have to um, avoid the temptation to think of um, marginalized women as, uh, to, to think, for instance, I had a conversation with some folks in Australia about this today, to think about gender and race as two separate things, or to think about gender and disability as two separate things. And, or to, and part of the difficulty we have in Scotland, and to talk about our policy landscape, is that uh, about 15 years ago, one of the previous Scottish governments made a choice to move away from having gender equality as a separate piece of work, um, and threw all the equality in the equality salad. And uh, th that has had a really dire effect on some of the, the thinking and understanding about gender. Um, and it has made women a minor. It treats women as a minority group. So we have, you know, so the the policy processes. So if you look at equality impact assessments, um, which are, you know, the bane of my existence, I have to say, that that you know what they'll what you'll see is you'll see some public sector body going, well, this is the impact on women, and this is the impact on. Um, uh, BME people, and this is the, the impact on people with dis disabilities, um, disabled people. But you know what they haven't thought about is how all of those inequalities um, res make you know respond or work together. Um, and uh, I think the biggest thing that we could do to change the way we mar we both minoritize women and make uh, black women and disabled women and, you know, um, uh, women with lots of different identities um, and challenges um, and discrimination that they experience uh, more visible in the system is to stop separating them out and then wiping out their gender. So uh, the way I would really like to see our policy arranged so that it was gender and disability and gender and race and then, and then, and then race and disability and do you know what I mean? So that there was no, um, this salad approach has really been problematic. And I see it in conversations with public officials all the time, that they they treat women as if they're a minority, and then they treat minority populations as if they have no gender. Um, and, uh, you know, it it's really difficult to hold them accountable for doing the right thing when they don't even understand what the right thing is. Yeah, good point. Um, Davy, would you like to respond to a comment from Julie Bell? Um, 
She says when eight-year-old boys have access to porn and smartphones, generational learned behaviours are seen as okay. So do you think technology and, and you know today's um, you know what young people today are are surrounded by is that making it worse? Yeah, I mean I think it, it brings home an aspect of modern life that has changed things, which is just accessibility to whatever it may be that um, that people are obsessing on. Uh, and if that's it, that that provides accessibility to porn for young people, um, and if that's their education in terms of how men and women interact, then that's clearly that's going to create problems. Um, I mean, that's, it feeds into a lot of the comments and the discussions that are on the go just now about social media and how it should be moderated and how it should be controlled and uh, you know and problems of anonymity within it and all that. The kind of angles on it, um, because it it exaggerates the access to these kind of attitudes. Um, but yeah, I mean, we know about this in terms of some of the work that we've done in the past. Um, I, I think you know, of a piece of work that we did linking with Aberlour some years ago now. But um, you know, we were talking about violence against women in general. We were talking about um, violent attitudes amongst young men. Um, and a member of the group had asked to speak to one of the workers afterwards, and his point he was trying to raise was, my girlfriend objects to the amount of porn I'm watching on my phone. What should I do about it? And his problem was her raising it <laughs> rather than the amount of porn he's watching his phone. Yeah. Uh -huh. and after, after a discussion, he he came round to the, the idea that, well, my choice here is to continue doing what I'm doing or I'm going to lose my girlfriend, and at least then he started to catch on that the, the 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 change here that was needed was for him to make if he wanted to keep his relationship. Um, so, you know, when the conversations open up the door to him thinking differently, then there is room for change. The problem is just the sheer volume of it and sure. the effect it's having across the board. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank thanks very much, Davy Marsha. You want to come in on this? Yeah, I um, I really would, which is, um, I, of course, agree with everything that Davey said, but I think it's really important for us not to, it, I think that um, technology and um, uh, the internet uh, is a convenient scapegoat for um, the, the exposure of uh, young people to pornography. And it really masks what the, the core problem is which is that the pornography industry globally um, uh, can competes with the arms industry globally in terms of how much money it makes. And there are significant power issues involved here in controlling access to pornography. And that the very making of pornography is the making of victims of violence against women and girls. Um, and, uh, and those are the issues that are that are really core to the porn question, because the porn is a public health problem. Um, and I think it's become it's been put in the, oh, woe is me, this technology has so much to, you know, to be blamed for box rather than in the why do we allow porn yeah. on our airwaves, in our in our, you know, um, inboxes, et cetera. And part of the difficulty is this is a reserved issue. But part of the difficulty is also um, that we haven't been willing to treat it as a public health issue. And if we were willing to talk about it as a public health emergency, just think about how many more tools we'd have to deal with than, than this notion that somehow young people were misguided because they were accessing these horrible images online. But actually, mm -hmm. it's the industry that's the problem. Sure, yeah. Thank you. Um, Karen, can I, can I ask you to respond to a question from Hannah um, from Glasgow? She said, are we dealing or are we prepared to deal with the impact of lockdown and violence against women, not just in relation to domestic abuse, but also the impact on young people with the closure of schools, along with the radicalisation of uh, online communities such as incel groups? Um, thanks for the question. Um, are we ready for it? No. Um, will it pose problems? Yes. I'm actually struck here between 
a point of connection with what Marsha was just talking about in relation to pornography, because I think the challenges will be both similar and new. And I think that about internet pornography as well. And I agree with everything Marsha said. At the same time, the ready availability of pornography on the internet does do something specific to ideas about instant gratification, um, entitlement to something right now, right now. And because so much more of our lives have moved online through lockdown, I think that will have many long term implications in this field, and, and not just pornography, I mean, men's violence against women generally. No, we're not prepared. And one of the reasons we're not prepared is that actually, when I say we, I've got to be careful, I, I don't just make myself sound um, technologically illiterate here. But I think part of the issue is that most of us don't have the skills to deal with this digital world because it was kind of over the last 18 months, a lot of it has been foisted on us. And so actually a lot of the newer forms that violence against women might be taking, men's violence against women in this context, yes, they echo old, um, old forms of violence, but also we, there's a different kind of vulnerability because we're less familiar with the tools. And so in some ways it goes back to the same argument that we need gender equality in every sphere. We need gender equality in IT and in tech, and we need gender equality, you know, at the table when these um, platforms are being designed. We need, you know, we need input at all levels. Um, so, okay. Yeah. Right. Thanks, thanks, Karen. And um, we've got time to squeeze in a couple of other questions, and I'll manage to read out maybe a couple of questions, well, comments, but without without a, an actual uh, question in it. Um, the one I'd like to ask all three of you, um, starting with Marsha, question from Simon Burke in Toronto, Canada. Do any of the panel members have a suggestion for new statutes or any specific statutory regulatory amendments to make women and girls safer? Um, well, if you're from Toronto, Canada, then I recommend that you look at our domestic abuse law, um, uh, which I I've spoken about in Toronto, so I know there's some folks there who are looking at it. Um, uh, and our Children's Scotland Act, which I think um, uh, uh, has really expanded the possibilities of the of uh, honoring children's human rights in the context of discussing domestic abuse and other forms of violence against women. Um, uh, I think that. Uh, the discussions that we're having um, in Scotland right now about a misogyny offence um, and a law against misogyny are really at the at the cutting edge of what what how law can help. And we all know from I think from what Davy was saying, I agree. You know, law is just one part of the messages that a that a society gives to people about what's culturally and legally acceptable. Um, I think that uh, there are no good laws on misogyny that have worked that I know about, um, and I'm hoping that Scotland can uh, can begin to try and craft an approach, both in legislation and in um, uh, implementation of exist those existing um, laws that will uh, broaden the notion that um, we can hold men responsible for um, uh, not for what they think, but for what they do. And, um, and that uh, creating an offensive misogyny is not clear to me how we will do that or whether we would ever get the law, the usual folks who would oppose it in, in Scottish society um, uh, to, come, to come on board. But what I do think is that the, the statutory regulations, some of them, um, uh, are we look at to enforce something that actually has to be changed in other ways. So for instance, the, the evidence that Engender um, uh, gathered for us when we were looking at uh, using an aggravator for hate crime, um, uh, adding a gender aggravator, um, made it really clear that, that the evidence that is available says that it was, it's never used appropriately because our systems don't recognize 
misogyny when they see it. You know, it's different from um, uh, a hate crime that happens to people because they're they're different from us. Misogyny happens in our own families, in our own relationships, in our own communities, and we need a different way of responding to it. And just changing the the name on the on the a tin, so to speak, around some existing statutory regulations isn't going to do that. What we need to do is change courts so that they they see misogyny when it's operating rather than doing victim blaming and all of the other institutions. Thanks, Marcia. Um, if, could I come to Karen and David? Could I ask you to be quite um, succinct, please, because we're fast running out of time um, and I, I want to do a wee wind up at the end. So, Karen, um, your thoughts um, on that? I, yeah, I'd echo Marcia. I don't think it's all about using, I mean, it's important to use law and regulatory amendments. It's not the whole answer. And how women and girls will be safer is when men and boys stop hurting and killing us. And how that will be achieved is something we can all play a part in. It doesn't just need to be lawmakers. Thank you. Davey, do you like to comment? I'd just add a brief comment. That, that mm -hmm. Really, the the issue in respect of new laws um, is partly highlighted just by the fact that it's Simon from Canada that's asked the question. I think it's it's important that we look at what's working elsewhere as well as broadcasting what's working here and trying to get laws that are effective, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in every sphere. Um, and just one other comment in terms of quite often laws. Um, in Scotland, uh, have got sections designed in them that are just to be informative about an aspect of things, such as you know within the Sexual Offences Act, there's definitions of what demonstrates that consent's not present. Um, I'm not sure we make enough use of those kind of sections that aren't actually framing the law as in punitive sections of it, but is trying to get messages across. Yeah. Okay, thanks, thanks, Davey. Um, we, we're running out of time. I just want to read out. There's two good questions, and I'm afraid we don't have time to get answers to them. But I just want to read them anyway. And one's from Alexis Campbell, and she's um, asking about female represent, representation in politics. She works at COSLA, um, and she said barriers to elected office is really depressing. Hearing stories of sexism, sexual harassment, and dinosaur-like attitudes in council chambers. And another link question from Jen from Glasgow says, um, key in my mind as we're heading to local government elections next year is that online abuse is putting many women off going forward for public office. We need a robust conversation about civility in public life as it will impact on future policy making, and we need diverse voices in our chambers to challenge. Um, so those are very good points, but unfortunately we are um, kind of running out of time. But I would like to um, thank everyone for their contributions to the event. And I'm sorry if we didn't get to your question, tried to get in as many as we could. Um, and before we close, I'd like to give each of our panelists one minute to sum up the issues raised in discussion. Um, if I can start with Marsha and then move to Davy and uh, Karen. Thank you. I think um, in one minute, all I can say is that um, we have to be. Um, bold and ambitious and courageous. Um, uh, I have to be because I don't have that much time left to do this work. <laughs> but also, um, I think that uh, I think if, you know, that whole thing about if not now, when, and if, uh, if not here, where. And I think there is no better place given the, the decades of the women's movement and the allies who have joined us and the um uh and the the increasing representation of women in government and parliament that it is it is time now for us to take to make a sea change in Scotland and and to gladly take up the task of leading on this. Oh, amen to that. Brilliant. Um Davy I would just say I think it's important for people to understand that if we're going to address this. We need to be talking about inequality. We need to be talking about men being silent about it, about power control, men in who are not perpetrators who are actually still saying things and doing things which condone it in the eyes of the perpetrators and make them feel more comfortable in our society. They should feel really uncomfortable in our society. And a big part of that is taking away entitlement. 
I mean, to work at that. But we do that by involving the non-perpetrating men and getting them to play their part. I think that's a key word entitlement, Davy. Thank you. Um, and Karen? In three words, smash the patriarchy. In slightly more than three words, um, smashing the patriarchy isn't one person with a big hammer. It's all of us chipping away at it. And I think that's a really important reminder that this is this is something in which we are all invested and which we can all help or make a difference or try. <laughs> thank, thank you, Karen. Thanks so much. Um, I'm afraid we have to end um, tonight's discussion there. And I'd like to thank the, the panellists for um, their really um, oh, super interesting and informed answers. And I'd like to thank everyone who joined in online. And again, apologies if we, if we weren't able to take your question. Um, you just made a great contribution to the panel, and, um, uh, and this was brought to you in partnership with Scot Scottish Women's Aid, as I said earlier. So, can I remind you, there's a helpline number on the festival web page for this event. Um, and thank you too to our BSL interpretation team of Jill Wood and Helen Dunnypace. May I take this opportunity to remind you that over the next few days, we'll discuss everything from radical solutions to poverty to fast fashion diversity in politics and climate action, among many events. So I do hope you can join in these discussions. And thank you and good night. <laughs>